The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe all things whatsoever they tell you, but do not follow their example. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to carry and lay on them the, on the people's shoulders heavy burdens, but they will not lift a finger to move them. All the works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and a salutation rabbi. As for you, do not be called rabbi. You have but one teacher, and you are all brothers. Call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. Do not be called master. You have but one master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus told his help, don't call any man father. And so I am. Well, what am I? Let's think about it. We have Jesus now teaching us, and whatever Jesus does, he does for a purpose. And Jesus is a teacher. Uh, what he does today is he does use a hyperbole. Hyperbole. I love that word. And if I would have been married and had a whole bunch of kids, one of the kids' would's name would be hyperbole. But maybe not. <laughs> anyway, what scripture is, you got to take it, you can't just take one sentence out of it and leave it at that. You have to read it in context with the whole scriptures. Let's just take, for example, the New Testament. Christ says, well, don't call any man your father, and yet here I am. What he does, he's using a hyperbole, meaning he's pushing things to the extreme. Christ also says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better be getting into heaven with one hand rather than two, with two hands be thrown into Gehenna. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Rather to enter hell with two eyes, enter heaven with one. Nowhere in scripture do you find anybody cutting off their hand or gouging up their eyes on their own. So there is some things which he uses a teaching techniques. This is important, so I'm gonna push it as much as I can, and he did. So now, let's look into the whole context in the book of, of uh, Acts of the Apostles. There is Saint Stephen, and scripture says, Saint Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he saw the heavens open up. I see the Son of Man on the clouds. But just before that, he does something strange. He addresses the Pharisees and scribes. Fathers! Corinthians, St. Paul, he writes them. I am your father in the faith. And St. Paul is a saint. St. John, in a couple of letters, he writes, addressing, writing to the churches. My brothers and fathers... So if they are not supposed to say that, why is it in the scriptures then? So it doesn't really hold to say, don't call anybody. He didn't mean it as an absolute. And besides that, you have children. If your children can't call you father, what are they supposed to call you? Well, you're a father, truly. Christ is also very special to us, and he was sent by the father. So what he does sometimes, he calls some people out of the ordinary life, to configure them to himself to be Christ the head. In Christ now, as Christ is married to the church, so these people called into himself, called priests or fathers, they have the very same characteristics as God. They are not God, 
but they have the same characteristics. The thing is, God is not a man. He is not a woman either. God doesn't have a gender. But as he sent Jesus into the world, he sent him as a man to symbolize what he is there. He is a life giver. When you get married, the man finds salvation. He finds it by giving. He receives. The woman, by receiving, gives. So they are necessarily two. They both need to be together. And together they are the oneness. And the oneness is symbolized the oneness of God and himself. So there's a very special thing about this marriage. And this is what the marriage is all about. Christ married the church. And for Christ to continue the church on earth, he called others, the apostles and disciples, and gave them power. So he made them priests. He made them fathers. And by the way, the Old Testament reading Malachi, the prophet Malachi, he was one of those guys living out in the country. And one of the Levites moved out from the city into the country. Malachi found out about it. He says, oh, ran over there. I'll give you clothing and money if you will be a priest and a father to me. So it's not just in the New Testament, it's also in the Old Testament. A priest and a father. And this is what we have as a priest. The priest is there because they are now configured to Christ. They are on the giving end. And what they give is not of themselves. They give graces of God. That's what they are ordained to be. To become ministers of stewards of the graces of God. To enrich and enliven people. Make them holy in the process so they will be able to find heaven. And a priest isn't of the world. Priests are different kind of animals. They don't listen to what the world says. They listen to God. They listen to God and what the God has taught us. And through the teachings of the church, we know what we need to teach. And this is what they adhere. And thanks be to God, we have Bishop Morlino. And they're attacked just about every day. Monsignor Bartilla, the vicar general, being attacked left and right just for teaching what is truth. But see, Christ came into the world to suffer and die, so why should it be different with priests? Priests are meant to enter into the death of Christ, and by gosh and golly, they will. It is a beautiful life as a priest, I know, because I'm sort of M1, and, but I wasn't, wasn't always a priest. I started off very little, like I've got three brothers, we a total of four of us, and mom and dad were practicing Christians. Dad was a cradle Catholic, mom was a convert from evangelical Lutheranism, and, well, she had to convert in those days, and so she did. And so they raised us, going to church, praying every day, all these things. My dad knew the faith, my mom, she lived it. And as she was being prepared by the priest for marriage, my dad was told by the priest, he says, you've got a gem there. Hold on to her for dear life. And he did. So she raised us, the classically, and she taught us the basic principles of the faith. And this is what mothers and fathers do. They are the first teachers of their children. So as we got older, we, well, going to church, we saw the priest. So dad gave us a little altar, got a little chalice, and got a little cookie to put on there. And so we played mass and priest. And the highlight of our thing was we had one of those uh, incense things. We had a little charcoal, lit it up, and put some things in there only once. And then we set half the apartment on fire, so my dad put it away. But the seed was sown. And as I grew older, I sort of like thought about maybe, maybe it would, but something kept me from entering into the priesthood. And what this thing was, was sin. Sin made me selfish. Rather, very, very selfish. And the further away from God I got, the more selfish I became and the less I wanted to listen to what God had to put in my heart. Because God at the moment when he thinks about us, before he even creates us, he has a plan for us. You're going to be a husband, a wife, you're going to be single, you're going to be a priest. He, he puts it in us. If we're able to enter into ourselves, we find that call which God has placed within us. And Sin made me not see it because I didn't want to look into myself. I was always blaming others for what I did. And so life was good for me, but it was very unhappy. But I was a terror of the town, so to speak. So eventually I moved out, lived my life away from God until finally 
My parents, what they eventually told me was, they prayed every day for me, they offered sacrifices, they fasted once or twice a week for my conversion. And it just wasn't done within a week, it went on for years. Eventually, God in His mercy sent someone in my path, befriended me, and He brought me back to the faith. And so I started to live for Christ now, because I went to confession, and that night, after so many years of living in sin, I walked out of confession. Was so, I was floating. I was, the burden was lifted off me. I said, wow, this is incredible. And so, for the first time, I was able to breathe again and sleep well at night, and I was able to look inside. And so, as I was looking, I was seeing, well, maybe I should think about helping others. Maybe I should become a priest. And with the help of a spiritual director, eventually, I was moved in that direction. The reason for that was because I knew before and after. You're bald, you use the product, you're going to have hair. Before and after. Before was sin. After, without sin. It was a total difference. So I wanted to help people experience what I experienced, the freedom as a child of God. And so this brought me into the priesthood and it was ordained. And Bishop René Gracida, back in 1993 in Corpus Christi, he ordained me to the priesthood. As he laid his hands upon me, I knew this was a feeling which was out of the world, and I knew this was, I should have been a priest all my life. I just couldn't take it because I was living in sin at that time. But now I was ordained. And for the first year, God blessed me. Just like a honeymoon, he lifted me up and I could just do anything. I could help people and do things and I knew what to do and the Holy Spirit was at work. I was just like, and after a year of honeymoon, he says, okay, I showed you how it's done. Now you do it. Then I was down back to earth and it was a little harder, but I learned. I learned to accept and take up the cross now every day. A little cross at first, heavier, heavier. And I learned how to enter into the mystery of the passion and death of Christ, dying to self, offering sacrifices, fasting for the people, doing all kinds of things. So little by little, I learned to die to self in order for the priesthood to be there, for Christ to be able to manage. And this is the thing. A priesthood is something so special, as is being a spouse to your spouse, husband and wife, each one has a calling, and the calling is just perfect for us, if only we find it. So, the priesthood. Some people are called. The thing is just, are they able to listen to the call? Today, there are so many noises out there, and people can't hear. And so they are seeking their own selves. That's why it's called selfie, because you exalt yourself rather than whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But nevertheless, priests are needed. Priests are a gift from God, and they give new life. New life wherever they're being sent to. But how can a young person know how to be a priest, for example, for a young man, if mom and dad don't go to church, they don't practice the faith, they don't practice the death which they said they would live after the, when they were baptized. So it is a calling into Christ Jesus. It's a very special calling that Christians have. They are totally different from the world. They are in the world, but not of the world. So we are called to something very special. And young people, maybe you're called to the religious life. Maybe a sister. A sister becomes the spouse of Christ. If a sister prays, you have no chance. God will do it because they are the bride of Christ. So who is holier? That depends on each person. Most times sisters are holier than priests. But nevertheless, we are each called to holiness to the degree which we can, well, achieve. But it takes a little work and effort on our own part. And Christ is there. He will guide us. He will help us. And just what would happen without a priest? Say, being a priest is something out of this world. If you really want to live, die. Die to self so that Christ, who is life, will be making you come alive. We just had our confirmation retreat Friday evening and Saturday. And you should have seen the children when they came on Friday afternoon. 
You could see the pressure still in their eyes from school, from peer pressure, this and that. They spent here Friday evening until almost midnight, came back in the morning on Saturday, left on Saturday evening, nine o'clock, and they were changed. You could see them. They were having, they had a smile on their face. They were talking with each other, not looking who is the best, but oh, how wonderful it was. It's just the spirit of God is alive. And now they're going to be initiated in two weeks, so please keep them in their prayers. Maybe one or two of them, or three, will be a priest, a religious sister, or brother. It will be a blessing, because they show us how to live and how to die to self, so that in dying, we might find life.